Hi, and welcome back to the Expansive Business Podcast. My name is John, and I'm one half of the Expansive Podcast. I'm an author, a keynote speaker, and a future strategist, and I'm always joined by my ever handsome co-host, Eric, who's an executive coach, author, and speaker, all the way from Johannesburg. What's happening, Eric? Hey, brother. Always good to be here. Uh, looking forward to the episode today. What a great uh, sort of add-on from last week, so I can't get wait. i uh, excited to get into it. Wow, you're really excited. You can't even get your words out. I can't get my words out. I've told you I'm in yeah. shutdown mode. Like it's, it's a miracle <laughs> that I'm here at all. Well, I'd like to thank you for gracing us with your presence to our weekly it's... expansive. <laughs> Everybody, round of applause for Eric arriving at his own podcast. Thank you so much, Eric. In your thank you for having me. Um, thank you for having me. And my cap, for those of you who can't see. Because John expects me that every time we record the podcast that I have to be in full attire. Uh, in my three-piece suit, ready to record and be very professional for everyone who's listening on the other it's side. Called, it's called respect, Eric. Respect, <laughs> Eric. Anyway, if you're joining us for the first time, we release a new episode every week about what it means for individuals and organizations to approach the future with an expansive mind. Join us as we challenge the status quo, banter about life, and expand our perceptions of what is possible. Our topic today is how to become incredibly successful, almost an equation that many people crave and want to have a grip and an understanding of. And we're going to share some of the bits and pieces around the latest research around how to become successful in the world that we're moving in. But let's start off with some big news that's happening out there in the world. And here in South Africa, we have a company called Yoko, who are sort of this Square of South Africa. If you know Square in America, the same owners as Twitter own uh, Square. And it's almost like this cell phone add-on for everybody to have a credit card machine. And Yoko is one of these incredible companies out of South Africa that have now raised hundreds of millions of rands. And they're really becoming a poster child for an African startup that's on its way to become a unicorn. And I always love reading these stories because I know how hard it is to come out of a South African sort of world and then start to compete on a more mm. global stage. And uh, I want to give kudos to the Yoko gents. Uh, I see them around Cape Town. And if you are listening to this podcast by any chance, uh, well done, guys. Uh, big ups to you. And uh, thank you for setting an example for the rest of our South Africans. Tell me any stories that are popping up for you there, Eric. Well, you know what really stood out for me as I was also going through the Yoko story is um, last night I was reading an article that speaks about the fact that oftentimes we there's a game that we get to play. So uh, we play the business game. And then what we do is that we add our own rules on top of the rules of this game. And that makes it more difficult for us. And so one of the examples they were using in this article is that they were saying very often a startup founder might get into their head this idea that the only way I'm going to build this business is I have to bootstrap it because that's the, that's the right way to build a business. Don't give away equity. Like uh, it's the honorable way that I get to scale a business. And actually, when you do that, you impose additional rules on top of the rules and you make it harder for yourself. So mm. we have to be very careful that we don't fall into that trap. And uh, I mean, these guys raising hundreds of millions is a good example of why sometimes you need to do that. So don't mm. make life more difficult for you than you need to, to for it to be. Um, good point. Yeah, listen, I mean, for me, you know, I was uh, going through Entrepreneur Magazine a bit, and I was just uh, reading the story about Bernard Arnold. Uh, he's the, uh, the CEO, I think, at the moment of uh, LVMH, like the big, big Very luxury fine. brand, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what's been fascinating to me, so I mean, obviously, like during the pandemic, uh, there was a, a period where he actually rose to number one. He's back down to three now, but he rose to one because I think the the share price like was three times that of, of Amazon in terms of growth. Amazon, Amazon grew in that same period by 7%. They grew by 21%. Wow. And what was just astonishing to me is, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile a few things that are happening in the world at the moment. It feels to me that we are going through a recalibration where people are saying appearance matters less, uh, mm. designer brands matter less, yet mm. here you have this luxury brand that just skyrockets. Mm. Mm. Right? Like, how do you reconcile that? What do you think is? I think certain markets around the world are doing exactly what you said, and other markets are doing the opposite. And mm. I think that you have these emerging markets that 
want to spend their money on these things. And there's the mature market that says, well, you know, I'm done with spending my money on those things and I want to now spend them on other things. And I think there's nothing wrong with luxury, but luxury is defined differently in every market and in every sort of consumer pocket. Mm. And so these guys own 75 brands, you know, it's not just one brand. So yeah. they've got like champagne brands and they've got like all these other brands. And so I guess some people faced with death, as many of us have been because of COVID-19, they want to celebrate their aliveness, I imagine, mm. with these sort of luxury brands. And if you think about Dubai's of the world, and in fact, I was having lunch with a friend from Kuwait and you were saying that people were lining up outside um, the luxury brand stores to go in and shop. And he's a vegetarian and he's super chilled. His name's Gaurav and he listens to this actually. And he was like, it's, it boggles his mind that mm. people are still spending their money on these sort of things. But you know, I don't want to judge anybody because look, I used to be like that. You know, when I used to live in Joburg, my watch, my car, my clothes was a high priority of how I expressed myself. And as I've grown up, it just becomes irrelevant to me. So well done to him for creating that. I would rather see a brand that's much more planet centricity, it got planet centricity rather than luxury centricity become more powerful. And slowly but surely, we hope that more of the world moves towards a more mature, guilt free consumption type of process because ultimately that gives you a longer standing of living on this world. Mm. When we are consuming at this rate, we are also hurting the earth in many mm. ways. But again, if last generation, your family was poor and now you're making money and now you want to celebrate it by buying a Louis Vuitton bag because that's how you grew up and that's what you saw at success, good on you. Enjoy it. And hopefully one day you won't need your 18th Louis Vuitton bag because that's really what does happen. It's like you go from one to two to three and you're like, you just, you can't, you can't keep up, right? So, mm. But look, um, I guess it's also, I mean, um, I, I wanted to get into the conversation about um, being successful, but I also think that, you know, your allegiance to like, um, like Nike or Adidas mm. or mm. Under Armour, like it's the same thing, right? It's just at a different level. And like mm. when we buy into brands, we buy into it because of an identity that's created around it. Mm. And I think that's, you know, that's a big part of what's at play for luxury as well, is that yeah. you buy into the identity of it. And Absolutely. to be honest, I, I also feel like a lot of the times there is just a very, very clear difference in the quality, you know, yeah. like, you, you, it's going to cost you a lot more, but the quality is going to be very different. And I was watching a video just before we jumped on, uh, talking about how Apple has smashed the luxury watch market yeah, because now you have a, a, a watch that's like a little bit more expensive than what it what a normal watch might be, um, mm. but it, it has all these different functions. So it's like tying into mm. your lifestyle. And mm. so I was saying how the Swiss market is declining and the the Apple yeah. market share is just climbing up. It's the most sold watch in the world at the moment. Yeah, by a, by a long by shot. By a long shot. Yeah, 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 by a long shot. I th and I think from, a, and a, but I mean, I mean, watches in general. When you then break it down into smart watches, they own mm. something like eighty-eight percent of the market. The mm. second, the second tier is Samsung, eight mm. percent of the market. Yeah, <laughs> that's the difference. So, yeah. but so it was interesting just to hear that that uh, many more people are opting for an Apple Watch, even though it's not, it's it's a perceived luxury, but it's not luxury right like when yeah, you speak yeah. about a swiss watch they said some of those watches have up to three hundred thousand moving parts in the watch yeah yeah and but this look, is just a, a digital thing no craftsmanship mass produced but but again it's redefining luxury eric you know some yeah. people ex enjoy like you know i see people around cape town driving old like old cars and they enjoy that luxury i could think of absolutely nothing worse the car's dangerous. <laughs> it's bouncing yeah. all over the place. There's no power steering. And you're like, you're cruising along, almost polluting the ocean, I mean, the earth because your engines are old. But you know, that's their definition of luxury. And I want to just give kudos to Seth Godin because can you just put my heart at ease? You know, when I see people doing things that I don't agree with, what's the response? Oh, that's just not for me. That's mm. all. So mm. I, I, I disagree that it doesn't have any craftsmanship. It's got a different type of craftsmanship, the Apple Watch. It's looking at different things that are important, not the moving parts, but you, your mm. body is the moving part. You know what I mean? So yeah, I hear you. I hear yeah. you. I think yeah. I think they have good design. I don't think they have good mm. craftsmanship. Craftsmanship is a guy sitting for a year with tiny little pincers putting this watch together. That's craftsmanship. Let, let me ask you. Right? Yeah, but let me ask you. What about technology? Technological craftsmanship where 
your phone and your watch are connected to your body and the Bluetooth works every time. And when you move your, yeah. that's, that's a technological craftsmanship because that, the layering of pro, yeah, it's just a different type. I get I, what, I know you. what you're saying, Yeah, but this is a different type of craftsmanship for me. It, it, it's very different. Yeah. It's like, it's like yeah. a JPEG versus painting the Mona Lisa. Again, look the behind the scenes of that JPEG to bring it to life. All the programming, all the internet lines, all the, all, all those things. Anyway, look, I, I know you're an Android uh, fan and you don't like Apple, so you're trying to break us down here. And I don't I even do want like to defend Apple. <laughs> like, I don't know why I want to defend Apple because they, they don't need me defending them and I don't want to defend it. But um, look, because you're I, the, I the biggest supporter, because you have like all well, the newest stuff arriving very soon, I right? Do. I yeah, do, yeah. I do, I do. Look, I, look, it's one of it's one of my luxuries in my life to have this technology around me. Plus, look, I have a mom and dad that now, like, my mom phones me yesterday and she's like, um, are you getting the new phone? I'm like, I knew exactly where this was going as she's yeah. asking me. I know she's going to listen to this. I love you, mom. I would give you all my phones, mom. But now, now I have another excuse. Like, I have to get the new phone because my mom and dad want my old phone. I like so, it. I like it. Yes, You're being yes, philanthropic, yes, yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, very you. <laughs> I love, uh, for all the times my mom paid my school fees now i'm paying back the phones <laughs> so we're all good but let's talk about today's topic let's because it. uh it's uh it's it's called how to become successful and it was kind of like sparked by two different posts that i made over the last week or so and both of these posts were very much like catalyzed because of my travels that i've just come back from um, and every time you you leave the bottle, you can see the label from the outside mm. a lot better rather than trying to read the label from the inside. And, you know, no amount of work inside Cape Town would have given me this perspective. And so really, it was just fantastic to get out there. And it's just changed so much of my thinking and didn't realize that I was almost stuck a little bit in, in a type of thinking, you know especially winter in Cape Town. It's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a dull time, you know, and uh, I ate far too much cake. And uh, so <laughs> you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that I need to evolve out of. So I'm going to read you the first post that I made, and then we can take it from there and actually look, unpack the first post, and then we'll get on to the second one. The first post is all about positioning, um, going where you are valued and where you are just, like, I suppose, like celebrated. This is what the post said. A bottle of water, and I wrote this when I was in the I was I was in the Dubai airport at uh, my flight was at three a.m. So I was sitting in the Dubai airport at like twelve-ish, having a coffee, trying to stay up. So I was writing this in dollars because I was in a dollar world. But it says a bottle of water in the grocery store is worth about fifty cents. Are we talking U.S. cents? The same bottle of uh, water in a bar costs a dollar. In a good restaurant or hotel, it can be worth up to about three dollars. And at an airport or on a plane, you're paying about $4. And I saw the same thing happen when I did Everest Base Camp in 2010. I saw a bottle of water from Kathmandu to the base camp of Everest quite literally go up 100 times. And that was just sure. because, you know, where, where it was positioned. So the bottle and the brand are the same. The only thing that changes is the environment. And each environment mm. places a different value on the same product. If you're feeling stuck, uninspired, devalued, or stagnating, have the courage to change environments and go where you can find flow again, where you'll be inspired, be valued, and ultimately be celebrated. And then I go on to say, as mm. I feel revived and realized how quickly your environment can change your dreams, aspirations, and achievements. And I this idea really was sparked by me having water at the airport, right? I sit in the lounge, thank goodness I'm past sitting there downstairs, but I, I didn't have to pay for my water, but I understand buying things. I mean, I think I was in Zurich airport and it's a, a egg mayo sandwich cost me like yeah. 80 something rand, you know, like really Zurich is amazing. Yes. And, and it was such an average, it was such an average <laughs> sandwich anyway. And so really the, the point here is, we don't realize that how important our environment is, when thinking about the possibilities we have, the future we have, and the intentionality we have. And we can even go further down to say, depending on when you were born, in which generational archetype you carry, you see a different version of yourself and your potential. Now, if you mm. think of a Gen X, 
and you think about their world of thinking about things globally, more consciously, and you think about a baby boomer and their regional sort of beat the competition mindset. And again, this is not all baby boomers, but most baby boomers come from that sort of characterization. It, it, it's so important to change environments, to continuously stretch your comfort zone so that you can keep thinking about new ways that you can express yourself. Now, mm. for me, going to Italy, and if anybody's been to Italy, I mean, look, I, I'm not gay, but those guys in Italy were so good looking. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, I was just gobsmacked. I, I, and and I, I don't know if I told you this off air, but I just thought to myself, thank God I'm not Italian because I don't know if I'd ever procreate with any woman because those guys would all look like <laughs> flipping... <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't get past that. So that anyway, um, so what got Italy got me thinking was the level of style, sophistication, dress, and body. You know, the, the guys are all in good condition there. And, and look, obviously, the girls are beautiful, but I'm, I'm talking about my own aspirations and my own intentionality. And then I got into Dubai, and, and a very good friend of mine on the evening of when I met him for a coffee was speaking to The Rock's manager about some business that they were pitching to The Rock. And I just thought to myself, oh my God, you know, it's like, they're thinking globally. They 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 positioning themselves in a different way. And I just forgot that when you live in South Africa, and it's not everybody. Again, I don't want to generalize, but when you live in South Africa, your goal sets become regional. Mm. And when your goal sets are living in Dubai or living somewhere else in the world, your goal sets change just because everybody's conversation is different. And so the idea here and the first sort of concept we want to bring across about becoming successful is how important your environment is. And how important it is to change, challenge, and shift the environment you're in so that you can have different conversations, you can be engaging with different types of mindsets, and to be able to think more expansively is always mm. going to be governed by the environment you're in. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, a, a very easy practical example of this as well is that if you think of the work that we do, um, a keynote like there's a ceiling in, in South Africa, like what you could charge for a keynote. Like there's a, a very kind of set ceiling that you, you're you not going to get past that. Whereas that ceiling is almost the entry level of what you would charge in the US, for example. So mm -hmm. already that just shows you that the same idea, the same packaging, the same exact thing is worth more in one context versus another. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even if we if we dial that back down and we say, well, you know, you ultimately get to choose the kind of customers that you want, uh, the market that you want to service. And you might want to start and target, you know, startup entrepreneurs. And there's going to be a certain cap to what you could be able to charge in that environment. Whereas when you are scaling it up and you get to, you know, coaching executives, for example, there's a different kind of price bracket. Absolutely. And in fact, it's not just... Um, that there's a, a different price that exists, there's almost a different expected price that exists. That if it isn't at this level being charged, I'm not quite sure if I want it. I'm not quite sure if it's good enough, right? Mm. Have you seen that? I mean, I often, these days, it happens to me quite frequently. It's like, I'll get a quote from someone and I'll be like, I don't know if you're expensive enough. I don't know if, if your <laughs> quality is going to be yeah. backed up by what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah. So it's also important to know that that. Um, as your environment changes, I think there's a signaling component that goes with it around pricing. Mm. Mm. But the, what I was also thinking as you were speaking is that the two ways we can approach this is that there's a shift in environment or a shift in packaging. So, mm. you know, if you think about a bottle of water to your example, if we go to the airport and there are three bottles of water and they're all the same bottles of water, but one is aqua water, one is mm. uh, whatever, and one is Louis Vuitton, whatever, as an example, <laughs> right? You are going to expect those to be different, even if they are the same bottle. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's why we've also always encouraged on this podcast that people build their personal brands, for example, because mm. without necessarily moving your environment, you can still increase perceived value by the way yes. that you package what you do and what it looks yeah. like, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and it, it, I think, I guess this thing has got two parts to it. It's, changing your environment to be inspired and then changing your environment to then repackage as well. Because yeah. I think when you step yeah. out of your environment, you realize the packaging you have and the potential of what packaging could be. And then when you step back in, mm. you've now got a new concept. So, mm. you know, travel, travel often, travel well and travel so that you can look for states of, of, of inspiration. And I feel incredibly inspired and really back on track to get back into Dubai and I'm back there for three weeks in November. 
and then I'm back there again in January to go and live there for the next six months. So yeah, it's it's it really sparked something for me. And again, this is very much the topic that we were mm -hmm. speaking about today. And you know, I made that video when I was in Dubai about thinking big and just realizing how regionally you think whenever you are in that sort of place, you know. And for me, one of the most exciting things about uh, living in Dubai is the fact that the country, the, the the city is so focused on the future and so focused on the flow of the future rather than trying to protect the past. And mm. Italy was exactly the opposite. Italy, look, Italy's got some amazing brands and amazing things that they're doing, but a very big part of Italian pride is Roman. It's the past that we're holding on to. It's like, we are the Romans. And yes, the Romans were powerful 2,000 years ago. You know mm. what I mean? They're still good, but... China is like moving to the future. The other countries aren't. You know, America is not. America's crumbling to many ways. Mm. So, you know, it's important also to put yourself into the flow of the future rather than the celebration of the glory of the past. Yeah, I like that. So that's really that's really key. And again, if you think about Bitcoin and, and if you think about crypto, it's again the flow of where it's going and where it has been is also important to ascertain. You know what I mean? Mm. Like where are you positioning yourself into the flow of growth or into the sort of the the comp the, 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 the the becoming smaller, the contraction of, of the other currencies. So mm. that's also important just to keep in mind, right? You want to say anything before I move on to the next? No, one? no, I think that's good. I, I just want to remind listeners that um if you if you are listening to this as your first episode, then go back and listen to the previous episode because the two episodes really are complementary in a, in a big way. So yeah, over to you. Okay, and then I want to talk about status. And this uh, was sparked to me by a podcast that I was listening to recently uh, where the guy was talking about how everything we do in our lives is to develop status. Whether and money is an example of status, right? The more money you have, the more status you have. The more intelligent you are, the more status. Like in the academic world, it's not money; mm. it's the papers that have been printed in the publications that make you have the status. And in gym, it's how big you are. In in triathlon, it's how fast you are. All of this is status building, right? And as we build status, we've got to realize that there's a short-term way to build status and there's a long-term way to build status. And ultimately, your life becomes better when you have higher status. That's kind of what it is. You know, you have to wait yeah. shorter times and queues. You can take more luggage onto the plane. You can have more uh, people of the opposite sex or the same sex, depending what you like, to have mating with. Because ultimately, that's what we do instinctively is we build status so we can have, we mate more often because we want to grow. I mean, that's really mm. a deep, deep sense of the, the idea of status. I imagine in caveman days, there was status in those villages and those caveman sort of processes as well. So the short-term way to build status and to become successful is to be a bully, a, a bulldozer, a somebody of power, a sort of dictator of sorts. And that always in the short run can seem successful, but there's always going to be gruntled, disgruntled, unhappy people waiting to take you down, just mm. waiting for the opportunity, you know? So you can control those crowds for a period of time, but eventually your status will be challenged and, mm. uh, and you'll come down. So the three characteristics that help us build status, success, in the long run, which is, this is what it's all about, are threefold. The first one is warmth. And warmth is really about this idea that is all about sort of empathy. It's about mm. being more nurturing to the people around you and sort of like hearing them out and, and, and then feeling a sense of belonging when they're with you. This, and we know when we meet somebody warm, you can feel it. And when somebody's cold, you can feel it. You know, there's no mm. engagement there. There's no compliments there. There's no, I was funny. I was speaking to my personal trainer yesterday. I was calling her cold beep. And she was laughing because she was never complimenting me. So I kept complimenting myself. I was like, John, well done. Eh? You did really well. I was like, geez, she's so cold. But she's not warm. And, and you know, bless her. She's really great. But we were laughing because I was like, geez, she's cold. So that, that warm. The second one is sincerity. And sincerity, you cannot fake. I guess you can't fake warmth either, but sincerity is empathy. It's, it's, it's this deep level of authenticity that you're bringing to the table. It's, and you, know, you don't have to be uh, quiet and meek when you're sincere. You have to be 100% yourself. And so when you're warm and you're engaging and you're empathetic, and then you're authentic in your sincerity and your approach, 
you've now got some real like momentum behind mm. people wanting to be with you and spend time with you and sort of like, you know, just engage with you. And then the last one is competence. And this is really key because this backs up your warmth and your sincerity. There's no point in being a warm, sincere, incompetent Muppet because that then doesn't help anything. Then you're just a nice guy who can't really, or nice woman who can't really finish the task at hand. So when I think about my team and I think about my business and my brand, I'm always telling them about this concept of, look, at every touch point, if we drop one of these characteristics, we drop the ball on long-term development of trust and of success, ultimately. So warmth, sincerity, and competence are the three sort of pillars that I see that are required to build status. And as we build the status, we start to develop long-term success. And it's in this long-term success that we find peace and we find sort of like this calmness as we start to build momentum behind our businesses and our brands. Mm, I really like that. Which one of these three do you think you need to work on the most? Warm. Warmth, really? Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I think, well, look, with you, I'm friendly, but people I don't know, I'm not always warm. I'm like, mm. like I don't know what they, I don't know, I, I like, maybe I have a mistrust initially when somebody's coming to me, I'm like, hey, like, what are you doing? Like, you know, I was actually in an Uber the other day with my friend, Sean, who went up Lion's Head, and he was so warm and engaging with the Uber driver. I was like, geez, I'd never do that. I'm like, yeah, because I, I don't know him, right? So I don't know, I don't know. It's like, you are so warm, you know? Um, which one do you think you need? But which yeah, three do you think you? No wait, which three do you think you need? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was going to use a PG-rated word to describe you, but earlier, uh, but then I decided I'll be nice. I'll be warm in, towards it. In what order do you think you need <laughs> to improve on all three of these areas? <laughs> yeah, definitely competence, warmth, and sincerity. Um, yeah, all of them. Yeah, yeah. No, I think warmth is definitely high on my list as well. Mm, mm. Um, and yeah. it's interesting because if I think of my Enneagram type, it would actually be sincerity. That would, that would be probably the immature version of my Enneagram type. Because um, with my Enneagram, like I'm a, I'm a type three and it's all about status, actually. It's all about chasing oh, wow. high performance and high achievement. Yeah. Oh, and so okay. often what, um, what an Enneagram three might do is to engage in kind of posery, I guess, um, mm. to display that, you know, mm. but yeah, I would think, I would think warmth as well. Um, mm. Competence, warmth and sincerity. Yeah. I think it's a great list. And I mean, I can see how this also ties into leadership that if you are mm. a leader, these are like the traits that you need to cultivate in mm. order for your team to trust you in order for you to be influential with your team. So it's not just, it's not even just status, um, that you gain, but it's it's being influential. If you if you have to break this down into a brand, into a business, who do you who do you think carries competence, sincerity, and warmth? I I've got one, but like do you, you better do you not say Apple. You better not say Apple. No, because I don't think Apple's warm. I was going to say the same thing. A I don't Apple's think they have warm. Yeah. No, they 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 sincere in their you know they really do go out of their way to try and give you the best product. That's very sincere of them, and also. The, Maybe that's just actually competence more so, but they're not warm. They're not like, you know, let's all sing Kumbaya together. There's nothing like that going on. We like, we super cool kids, like yeah. get out of our way. You know, there's like an arrogance there with them. I'm going to tell you, I think Microsoft ticks all of these boxes. Oh, wow. Okay. Besides Mac, Mac, besides Teams, everything besides else teams. in Microsoft, yeah. just like teams, <laughs> teams are shit. Sorry to swear, but terrible. Yeah. So, because um, I mean, from a competence point of view, the, I mean, 90% of the but world you know on, on their you're software. Actually, you're actually describing such an adult. I, I am, but he's... But actually he's super, yeah, he is the epitome of Microsoft. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and if I, you know, I have my brother working in Microsoft and I'm, I'm often listening to how they treat the people working for Microsoft. Wow. And it's incredible. There's such warmth. Mm. There's mm. such um, sincerity in them wanting to help and support people through difficult mm. times. Like, for example, mm. sometimes my brother will get like a like a random uh, deposit into his account that, and they'll say, go and buy food for the night. Like go and spoil yourselves essentially. What? Like, yeah. Like go to a restaurant tonight on us kind of thing. What? Yeah. Okay. 
Like, where, how do we apply for a job? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll find the application form. I'll do one free food. Free food? I'm working there. Yeah. Which brand were you thinking of? Woolworths. Um, Woolworths. Woolworths. I find, you know, I'm, my ex-wife used to work for Woolworths and um, not the way they treat their staff, maybe, because my ex-wife was so unhappy there, at times. But as a customer, I honestly do think they've always got my... Look, I think their pricing is sometimes ridiculous, but I think they're fair. I think of what they achieve and how they do it. And if we, whoever's listening to this that's not from South Africa, Woolworths is a sister brand to Marks and Spencers. And, you know, they, they set the standard when it comes to groceries and food. They like just streaks ahead of pretty much every brand I've seen globally, pretty much. Mm. Like, you know, you think you go to New York. I mean, New York's got terrible grocery stores. Uh, London's got some good ones. Dubai's got average ones, you know. I would, I would like everybody said like Spinney's would be the best or Waitrose, and I go there and they don't touch Woolworths, you know. So I, I mm. call Woolworths often Mama Woolworths because it's almost like as a bachelor you live on Mama Woolworths cooking for you. So for me, I'm a, I'm a fan of Woolworths, you know. I, 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 and when I come back to South Africa, in fact, all my friends that live overseas, not all of them, but a lot of them say to me they miss two brands: Discovery and Woolworths. Mm. Those are the two brands that they're like, we just wish we had that level and standard. Uh, here internationally and they don't you know they yeah. have an option yeah i i get it um i think what you're also making me think about is that competence warmth and sincerity can be broken down into into different areas of a business that mm. what you perceive as a client might be one thing but like I, i'm having issues with the sincerity part of Woolworths because i know that they've also copied like the small brands and in, in the ah, country often yes. you know yes, yes so i'm having problems with like that part of it but i can see that's more from a uh so that's supplier. Like, like yeah supplier business business side of things so yes there, there could be a different perception based on who you are in relation to the brand look you know i don't want to you know, i know that there was that whole copy thing right a few times yeah, yeah but many <laughs> times yeah. Um, yeah you know but the internet is a big place bro and there's there's inspiration from everywhere and so, yes, I guess, you know, they, they could have seen a brand and copied it, but I mean, the internet's big. Where do you think that small brand got their ideas from as well? So mm. I'm not defending Woolworths in any way. I think they could have done better. They could have reacted better many times to it. But I also think that when a small operator is being copied by a bigger operator, they also think that their little brand is, nobody else has seen it. It's like secret. Like nobody's ever done honey and turmeric. Like get over it. Of course mm. they have. It's, like, mm. it's so... I think there's there's something to be said there, but ultimately as a consumer, I feel the sort of three things around that brand. But yeah, you look, I like it. I think I think it's uh, what's it what it's reminded me most importantly is the level of warmth that required when dealing with people. Yeah, and when you think about people that are able to do that consistently, they really are more successful. You know, they really are because people are feeling that level of trust around it. So. Mm. Those are my points. Great. Um, Great. Have you got anything to add before we close off? No, I think that's excellent. Awesome. So thank you so much, uh, as always, for tuning into the Expansive Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend or with somebody in your team. If you really enjoyed it, then please head over to iTunes store and leave us a review. A quick reminder that you can book either Eric or myself to speak at your event. We also do combined learning experiences and also follow us on social media and please share your feedback on the show with us. We'd always love to hear it. Until next time, ciao. Amazing. Bye-bye.